Ready, set, go! Registration is now open for the Middle States Commission on Higher Education 2023 Annual Conference. It's in Philadelphia, December 4th through 6th, 2023, setting the standard transformation through accreditation. You don't want to miss it. Register now at msche.org. Surprise! We're taking the EdUp Experience podcast to Insights EDU. Join us for an incredible higher education marketing and enrollment management conference February 20th to 22nd in Phoenix, Arizona. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to Ed Up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. This is your special guest host, Dr. Michelle Cantu Wilson, filling in today for the amazing, incredible, and world famous Dr. Joe Salustio. I serve as a trustee for Sanderson College in Southeast Houston, and you can follow me on LinkedIn to see what else I'm up to. I'm so excited to introduce a university educator and the author of a book that will soon be available officially on September 19th. The book is called The Abundant University, Remaking Higher Education for a Digital World. And the author is none other than Dr. Michael D. Smith of Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs> Sorry about that, Michael. Michael, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for, for having me, Michelle. I appreciate it. No problem. We are excited to have you on and to hear all about your work and your book. So we're just going to kick it off, uh, Michael. Tell us, what do you do and how do you do it? So I study how technology changes firms and markets and institutions. Um, and I do it using the tools of economics, um, the tools of organizational behavior, and, uh, and, and a lot of the tools of the information systems uh, literature. Interesting. That's a lot. It's, it's fun and interesting. Um, and, and what we see a lot is that, you know, when a new technology comes into an industry, the established players in the industry dismiss its importance and, and dismiss its possibility of changing how they do business. Mm. Um, so my colleague and I wrote a book in 2015 um, about the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. And we, we did a lot of research with the entertainment industry. Um, and, and their attitude was, you know what? We've been around for the last hundred years. Technology hasn't changed how we do business. I don't think anything's different about what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. um, and what we tried to argue in the book was, here's what's, here's what's different. Here's why you ought to be concerned. Right. I got interested in this, uh, in, in this in the context of education when around 2020, I started to hear my colleagues saying basically the same things that we heard from the entertainment industry in 2015. We've, we've always been safe. Technology's never changed how we do business. Um, why is today any different? And, and so I started writing the book as a book about disruption, you know, technological mm -hmm. disruption. What the I book saw, ended up. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Let, let me interrupt you just real quick. I saw on a, yeah. on a YouTube video, uh, a presentation that you, you did on this very topic, uh, that quote that, that, uh, kind of stirred up some drama there on the, <laughs> On the, on the video, which was, you know, nothing has changed for the past hundred years uh, in the entertainment industry. And then I, I know that you mentioned in that same video um, that there are a number of universities that have, you know, survived uh, change. Um, I'm trying to find where I wrote it down, but a, a large number of universities that 70 out of 85 major universities that have survived uh, major change over the years. And you challenged this. So I'm I'm pretty excited that you make uh, that you know that uh, comparison there between the entertainment industry and higher education because it is unusual but it is so interesting. So I'll let you go on. Yeah. So this the the quote that kind of motivated our entertainment industry book was we had the president of of home entertainment at one of the big six studios come to uh, our class in 2015 mm -hmm. and 
my colleague Rahul asked him, are you at all worried about the threat that Netflix and Amazon and Google might pose to your power in the entertainment industry? And he said, uh, my business is different. You know, I'm not, I'm not worried at all. My business is different. The same six studios have dominated my business for the last hundred years. There's a mm. reason for that. That's not going to change. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah. And, and what, you know, you, you use that in class and, you know, the students get all angry and, you know, so how could somebody <laughs> say that? And, you know, it's, it's a good mic drop quote and you sort of let them indulge that anger. And then you say, but, but wait a second, what he's saying is a hundred percent true. The same six studios had dominated his industry for the last hundred years. Sure. And it's not like the internet was the first technological shift they'd faced. They faced massive technological shifts. Why would today be any different? And so hmm. the, the book Rahul and I wrote was trying to just, you know, trying to explain why 2015 was was different. Why did the technologies the entertainment industry was facing in 2015 pose a threat that they hadn't seen before? So fast forward to 2020, Michelle, which, what you're saying is I I heard uh, the, the, the then president of Ohio State University get asked almost the same question mm -hmm. and give what I'll characterize as almost the same answer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what he said is, you know what, my business is different. The same 62 universities have dominated my industry for the last 500 years. There's a reason for that. And that's not going to change. Um, and that so thinking I started fascinates writing. Me. Yeah. And, and again, he's right. He's a hundred percent right. Um, so you've got to explain why is today any different? And that's when I that's what I started to try to do in the book. About halfway through writing it, though, what I realized is I don't think the technological change angle is the real story. Mm -hmm. I think I think the real story is social justice, right? I think I think the real story is we in higher education are trapped in a system that we know excludes poor people just because they're poor. And it's not like we're excited about that, but mm -hmm. that's that's just way our, the way our system works. Can we use technology to do better? And what I'm trying to argue in the book is I think we can. I, I completely agree that we can. And I, as a former faculty member, um, you and I both know that every faculty member during the pandemic was made aware of the inequities that students faced in regard to digital technology and access um, because of the pandemic, you know, because of moving to an online learning environment. Suddenly we became aware that, oh my gosh, we're not doing enough. Um, and so the, the responsibility was, you know, dually placed on colleges and universities. Um, and so when you approach that issue of social justice you know, as you were writing, what kind of feedback did you get? Or what were the discussions around this idea of, you know, social justice, you know, is an issue in many different spaces. And one of the biggest ones that we're finding in higher ed is digital access. Yeah, I, 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 I what I've discovered is I think that's the right way to approach the question. If you okay. approach it as disruption, there are a lot of people who are just absolutely convinced that, you know, we were told in 2010 that that uh, MOOCs were going to change higher education. They haven't changed it. Therefore, uh, technology will never disrupt my business. And, and it's I think it's wrong. Um, but what I realized is you're never going to win that argument. Uh, right. What I'm trying to do in the book is is just say, hey, we've got one point eight trillion dollars in student loan debt. Mm -hmm. And. What the data tell us is that if you're born into a family in the top 1% of income, um, your kid has, a, a, you know, you have a one, one in four chance of getting admitted to a top 80 most selective school in the United States. If you're born into the bottom 20% of income, you've got a one in 300 chance of getting admitted right. to the same school. Um, do we really believe that rich kids are 77 times more likely to be capable of an elite education than poor kids are? No, mm. um, but that's the system we're trapped in right now. And I don't, I don't see how we change it by tweaking the, the existing parameters. Yeah, I agree. I, I, that kind of hit home for me, uh, Michael. I, I was a kid in extreme poverty uh, in the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas and wanted to go to Syracuse 
to pursue acting. Um, but the major barrier was they needed a video interview. And uh, I didn't know anybody who had a video camera and I was too embarrassed to ask. Um, yeah. And so I was fully capable, uh, but the access wasn't there and it was related to, you know, some, some form of technology. So um, I like the way that you, you pose that, you know, as a question. And, and I did see uh, one of the things that you said on, on that YouTube video that I encourage every, everyone to watch. It's very interesting, great discourse was you said, I've been an academic so long that I don't take anything personally. Um, which, you know, <laughs> I thought that was so awesome because truly you're asking questions, um, and, and you're asking questions about really sensitive topics. Like the description in your book on Amazon, um, says, um, a system based on exclusivity cannot foster inclusivity. Yeah. And I think that's so powerful. Talk to us about you know, these deep seated feelings that obviously came up in the writing of this book. It's, I mean, when, when you think about, you know, what are the sources of, of market power? And I'm not going to apologize for using that. There are a lot, there are a lot of people who get really angry when you say higher education is a business. Oh, um, I don't get angry. Tell me more. <laughs> I, I've gotten I've gotten a lot of pushback on that idea, and I want to be very clear that's not all higher education is. But if we right. ignore the components of what we do that that are a business, I think we're going to ignore the signals the market is the market is sending us. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you know one of the things I'm trying to do in in the book is say let's look at the incentives we have in in our market. Um, and a lot of them are based on increasing exclusivity. Um, and then we've got this other key value that we all have is to want to create an inclusive environment. So we're trying to create an inclusive environment in a world where we're rewarded for being more, more exclusive. Um, I just don't think that's going to work. Give me an example of, of, you know, kind of promoting that exclusivity or, you know, advancing on that. Well, I'll great. give you a very specific one that, that we talk about in the book. Um, both of my kids when they were, you know, getting ready to look at colleges right after they'd taken the, the, the PSATs, got a whole bunch of recruiting material from schools that, you know, based on their GPA and based on their PSAT scores, they were not going to get admitted to. Hmm. Um, and in many cases, what the schools were saying is, we're so interested in you, we'll waive the application fee. Um, and one of the schools was the University of Chicago. And my wife and I were sort of staring at, you know, why is the University of Chicago sending all these recruiting materials to, you know, when based on the numbers, they're not going to admit our kids. Um, and about two weeks after that, the Wall Street Journal had an article that said a bunch of elite schools, including the University of Chicago, are buying data from the college boards to recruit students they know they won't admit because that's a good way of, of decreasing their, their admit ratio and admit ratios matter in terms of how people perceive you in the marketplace. Oh, right? that's, you might, I, yeah. that, if you could see my face, I should turn my camera on that really does not feel good. That doesn't, that feels horrible. Uh, that hurts. That, that hurts. Um, but then what I say, you know, what I show in the book is there was an intentional effort by the University of Chicago to increase their rankings. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and a part of that was decreasing their admit rate. And it was successful. They, inc they increased their rankings in the U.S. News and World Report. You know, so they did the right thing based on what the market was telling them to do. It right. just turned out to be the wrong thing based on what we would want a university to to invest in. And How I, do I we can you go I ahead. don't I don't blame them for you know following a business model that works for their business. Um, but that's that one hits too close to home, you know, to the student who aspires um, to be admitted to a university that they feel is the right fit for them. And I, I think that that fit on the student end. Is, is not considered in a business model like that. But I, I, I agree with you. I, I, it is a business model. It has to be a business model. And a lot of times uh, we don't pay close enough attention to that. And I'll give you an example. When I was the director of teaching and learning initiatives um, at my college, 
I got used to just ignoring those tech sales emails. I just, I just didn't deleted all of them because I wasn't in charge of tech sales and I wasn't going to get to approve, you know, this type of stuff, or I would forward them to the right person. But what do those folks know about the digital world and the advances that I was ignoring back then? Um, and how often do we put ourselves in the position of saying, oh yeah, that doesn't even apply. We know we have a system, we have an LMS you know, we have this software, we have that software. Um, do, do we put ourselves at a disadvantage when we ignore, if it's a mod, if it's a business model, do we put ourselves at a, at a disadvantage if we ignore the business and sales aspect of colleges and universities? I really think we do. I think we, we as faculty, if we ignore the, the component of this that is, has characteristics of a business, like I said, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna miss the signals the market is sending us. Um, mm. I'll give. You, I'll give you another. Another. You know, entertainment quote with an analogy to higher education. In uh, twenty, I think it was twenty thirteen, the COO of of the Fox Corporation stood up in front of an investors conference and said, "The cable business is safe." Um, and his and his quote was, "People will give up food and a roof over their their head before they give up cable television." Um, and what we know is, over the next wow. five years, cable business. And and when I when I talk about that in class, what I say is, I think he was right based on the data he was looking at. You know, what I think should he have been looking at? I, I think what what he was looking at is a bunch of surveys that showed that, yeah, people will get behind on their mortgage payment and they'll get behind on their credit card bill before they get behind on their on their cable bill because they don't want their cable cable to be canceled. Right. What he was concluding is people love cable. Um, people must love our service. I think what he missed is it's not that they love the service. It's that they didn't have any alternatives. Once, oh, my goodness. Created yes. alternatives. People start, you know, we, we saw this huge shift. What's the analogy? I, I hear a lot of, you know, university administrators saying essentially the same thing. People will give up food and, and a roof over their head before they give up on a four-year degree. And I think they're right, but I think they're right because our students don't, it's not that, it's not that parents and students love universities, it's mm -hmm. that they don't have any, they don't have any alternatives. Um, I, I agree with that. And and I, I'll take it to like the adult basic education level. Uh, the students that I taught, um, I was mainly trying to find them, you know, where, where do you fit in this world? Do you want to go academic or do you want to go non-credit? And giving non-credit as an example, bank teller classes, right? Uh, plumbing certificates, uh, aerospace engineer. Those are the things that are offered right now that your typical credit student on a transfer pathway to a university has no idea even exists. Um, yeah. Just because it's a business and the business model works best when we promote the classes that, you know, align to a longer revenue stream, I guess. I, we, have, we have people who teach topic X and they need, they need students in their courses. And so we keep topic X in the in the curriculum. Um, and mm. I've, you know, I've I've seen this, right? You know, when when we move from C plus plus to, mm -hmm. you know, to Java to Python, mm -hmm. um, the people who teach C plus plus have a strong belief that we need to keep teaching C plus plus because you know it's important for students to learn, blah, blah, blah. Mm. That I think is driven in part by the fact that this is this is what I've always taught in the past. Um and you know, sort of expand that across the entire academy. Um, right. You know, are we are we teaching the things that benefit us, or are we teaching the things that that will genuinely benefit our students where they're at? You know, and your and your point, this this is a student who wants to go on and do you know work work in the trades. Fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they let's know about them, it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's give them the material. Should you register for the Middle States Commission on Higher Education annual conference this 
December 4th through 6th in Philadelphia? 100%. I agree, because the title of the conference is called Setting the Standard, Transformation Through Accreditation. There is no time like the present to explore opportunities in higher education and the future for our students and our business model. Get out and network with your peers this December 4th through 6th at the Middle States Commission on Higher Education Annual Conference. Attention. Are you ready to elevate your institution's marketing and enrollment strategies? Join the Edup Experience podcast at the Insights EDU Conference, February 20th to 22nd in Phoenix, Arizona. Don't miss out on this opportunity to hear from engaging speakers from industry-leading companies like Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, and higher ed leaders. Learn the latest marketing and enrollment strategies to grow your programs. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code Add up to save $50 off your registration. Attention. And, and you said, you know, that, that, that's it right there, I think, is if we paid attention to, or I'm, I'm guessing this is what you might be saying, if we paid attention to what our students actually wanted and what they were interested in, uh, we might make some of what we're doing obsolete. Um, and, and this is, a, this is, I know this is an unusual um you know, reference point here, but I saw an interesting video the other day of a young Tupac Shakur uh, talking about education. And he mm. says, you know, it would be one thing if it was reading, writing, and arithmetic. And then the next year, it was something new and interesting and different. But instead, it's reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the next year, it's reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the next year, it's reading, writing, and arithmetic. And he said, in my world, that is not going to be useful to me. Uh, nor is it interesting, right? He was very young. And I thought, I sent it to my husband because he's a high school engineering teacher. And I sent it to my kids because I want them to think beyond the rote, right? Um, but what do you think about that idea of how that compares to like the digital divide that we see between students and faculty? I, I'll, I'll give you a, a fast, to me, a fascinating example. Um, Outlier.org is a platform um, that uh, gives college gives gives online courses and you get college credit at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, okay. And my daughter, when she was in high school, my daughter was president of the Steminist Club at her high school. So take feminism and combine it with STEM, and you have Steminism, right? Oh so my I, gosh, I, that's amazing! Yeah. It's a beautiful thing, right? Right, my, my daughter. I, a young steminist um, wants to take AP physics and her mm -hmm. high school says you can't take AP physics because you haven't taken AP calculus and you can't take AP calculus because you haven't taken pre-calculus and we're not offering that this summer. So you're stuck. Um, wow. And, and me, as, me as a dad said, there's this online calculus course that doesn't require pre-calc as a, as a prerequisite that will give my daughter credit at the University of Pittsburgh, are you really saying to, to me that if she doesn't pass that, she's not ready for AP physics? And, and, and we won that argument, right? Good for you. What's, what's, well, but what's really interesting about the way, a, what, the way Outlier teaches AP Calculus is they have three different teachers. They've got Tim Chartier, white guy like me. Mm -hmm. They've got Hannah Fry, a, 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 you know, a, a woman. Um, and then they've got John Urschel, African American um, guy who got his PhD from from MIT, and by the way, before he started his PhD, was the starting uh, starting guard for the Baltimore Ravens. Um, oh my goodness! Just munch on that. But they've got wow. three different perspectives, very very different professors right. teaching same material in their own voice, using right. their own examples, and the students can choose which of the professors they they decide, you know, they decide to gravitate. And, you know, and if you don't get it from Professor A, you can listen to the same material from Professor B. Okay. Guess, guess which teacher my, my daughter gravitated towards? The, my, steminist, my steminist daughter. The, um, the female teacher? My steminist daughter immediately gravitated towards Hannah Fry and, and her teaching style. And, what was, and, and I mentioned this to a colleague of mine and she's like, oh, Mike, there's plenty of studies that show that in general, there's a performance difference between men and women in STEM classes. You know, in general, men perform better than women in STEM classes. And that performance differential goes away when the class is taught by a woman. Mm, wow. In general, 
the, you know, the, the dominant ethnicity performs better than the, than minority ethnicities in STEM class in, you know, in, in, uh, I think the, I think the paper was on, um, I think it would, I think it was on STEM classes. You know, there's a paper in general, and that difference goes away when the class is taught by someone who shares your ethnicity. I mean, we know representation matters. Uh, that that's you know, definitely something that, does. yeah, it, it absolutely does. And, um, but, but we're trapped in a system where, you know, if you're in my class, you're stuck with a white guy. Um, right. And, and there's not, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could let students self-select into the teachers who, you know, who, who they identify with um, and, and we speak do that to them through a course. digital, we do that digitally with a, with digital access to alternative of, methods, right? Yeah. One of the things I document in the book is if you look at the diversity of outliers professors, it's off uh -huh. the chart. If you compare it to the diversity of, of higher education professors, you know, it, it is, we, we don't really compare. And I'm sure people are going to say, well, that's not really fair. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, they're right. But, it, but in another sense, we've got this other, this other model over here where we can, we can create a much more diverse faculty. We know Absolutely. that's going to be good. And that is, I, I really love this idea that Outlier makes it possible, you know, in a digital world for students to seek the representation that they need. I remember being taught Mexican American literature as an undergrad by a white woman. And not that she didn't know the content, Michael, she did. She knew the content, but I, I could have pursued that probably at a much younger age. I'm now passionate about Mexican American literature as a 49 year old woman, but I, I can't help but wonder, you know, what it would have done if representation, you know, had, had uh, made it, had made it, you know, made itself known at a younger age for me, but I digress. Um, let's, let's get back to your book and, and your messaging. And I think representation is a wonderful um, topic that you bring up because it does address that exclusivity versus inclusivity part of what you talk about. Yeah. Um, and what, what I say, you know, one of the things I play around with in the book is, is, Think about the fact that my value to the academy is that I'm a specialist, right? I got tenure by becoming, you know, the world's recognized expert in this incredibly narrow area of my field. But yes. when I teach, when I teach, I so my value is I'm a specialist. When I teach, I teach like a generalist. I teach, mm -hmm. you know, I teach Eric Brynjolfsson's work and Catherine Tucker's work and, and Ed McFallon's work, you know, and Natalia Levina's work. Wouldn't it be cool if the students could hear it from Eric and Catherine and and Ed Absolutely. and Natalia, yes. who who are great teachers? You know, who not not only are great ac academics and scholars, they're also great teachers. Um, why don't we do that? Well, we don't do that because Eric's at Stanford and Catherine's right. at at MIT and Natalia's at NYU and Ed's at Ed's at HBS. Right. We now have the technology where we could act, do a much better job of incorporating those different areas of expertise but who Why? would that benefit in a growth sort of way who would that benefit in terms in terms of students yeah oh, i'm being uh, sarcastic no it would absolutely oh, benefit the students but is that a good business model um here's, for for universities and here here's where i try to bring that the last chapter of the book is again another analogy to what i saw in the entertainment industry the entertainment industry initially opposed technology rightly because it was a, because it posed a threat to their way of doing business. It posed a threat to their business model, and it really did. Um, at some point, I remember having a discussion with a pretty senior creative person at one of the big st six studios in the ex you know in the executive cafeteria and he mm -hmm. sort of leaned forward to me and very you know sort of quietly so none of his colleagues could hear said mike we sold my show to netflix a year ago oh. i want you to watch the season of my show that netflix just put out and you're going to see that it is in every way better to what we did on the lot you know wow. the cinematography is better the storytelling is better and i just can't figure it out Right. And he was like genuinely troubled by this. Um, and I honestly think that around the time the entertainment industry started to see 
Netflix and Amazon uh, take home awards at the big award shows, what they realized is my model isn't my mission, right? My mm. mission is selling shiny plastic discs for 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. My mission is creating great entertainment and getting that entertainment in front of the right audience. Right. And if I can, if I can fulfill my mission using technology, I'm willing to blow up my business model. And I, and I think that's what we've seen in the entertainment industry. We've seen, yeah. you know, innovative companies like Disney say, I'm going to completely blow up my business model because I want to create great entertainment that's going to delight audiences. And yeah. what's, the what's, the, what's the parallel, right? The parallel is obvious. What's our mission as educators? If our mission is helping rich kids get a leg up in the job market, then we're doing great, mm -hmm. right? That's not our mission. <laughs> oh, gosh. No. I mean, I know that access does not equal success, right? But it certainly matters from an equity standpoint. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I can see how in higher ed that there would be so much resistance, especially for those longstanding universities with their branding on point, um, who have, you know, turned it into a, a well-oiled machine who, you know, bank on tradition and sell tradition. I can see how there would be so much resistance to blowing up the business model the, the way that you said. Um, and I think that that essentially goes to a leadership um, realm. And I know, and you know, that there are a great number of uh, coming retirees in higher education. Um, we, we knew this about five years ago that we were going to see a large number of presidents and chancellors retiring around this time in the next few years. And I wonder if there will be any change um, uh, of evaluating business models based on, let's say, enrollment numbers, you know, that I know colleges and universities are trying to move back up to the pre-pandemic levels. What do you think? I, well, A, we could see change, right? We could see change as the old guard moves on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really inspired by the leadership we see of Mike, Mike Crow at, at ASU and Paul LeBlanc at sure. Southern New Hampshire, people like that. Right. who have said, I'm going to blow up the business model yes. um, to pursue a much more open and inclusive uh, uh, system of higher education. And they open invite all of us to it. That's the best part is if ASU is like, we're having a conference, everyone come. And here we are in this amazing experience that I never even thought about until today would impact a student in a much more powerful way than it probably impacted me. Really good point. Yeah. Really good point. Let's Let's bring everybody to the table and let's learn from each other so we can all get better as yeah. opposed to I'm going to protect my secret sauce and, yeah. and you can't have it. Right. Um, I interviewed R. Austin uh, for the for for the book and, and I, I quote her in the book. R. teaches the R. R. teaches organic chemistry online at Arizona State University. OK. How do you teach organic chemistry? You know, how do you teach organic chemistry labs online? Um, and what she said is we looked at our curriculum and what we realized is 13 of the 14 weeks work perfectly well online. And so we bring the students on campus for a one week intensive organic chemistry lab experience where you do two mm -hmm. labs a day, one in the morning, one in, one in the evening. And then we surveyed our residential students who do, you know, one, one chemistry lab a week. And we surveyed our online students who do this intensive experience. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered is their knowledge of the lab is the same, but the online students have a stronger identity as scientists. Mm -hmm. that there's something about doing this in an intensive one week experience that I walk away saying, I'm a scientist versus doing it one week, you know, once right. a week for 15 weeks. And you, you just sort of stare at that and you go, oh, that makes, that actually makes perfect sense. Of course. Right? Of course. Um, I would love for us in the high, in, in, in the academy to take a harder look at our practices Absolutely. and try to figure out 
which, which of the practices need to be done in person are best done in person and which of the practices can be done perfectly well online. Right. Um, I think right now our assumption is the way we've always done it is the way we should always do it. And I would love for us to question, question whether we're going to be able to fulfill our mission as educators if we mm -hmm. keep that approach. I don't think we can. I really well, I mean, it's, it's certainly the safer approach, but you know Gen Z and I know Gen Z and, you know, Generation Alpha is coming. It is, our students are changing at, at such a phenomenal pace in such interesting ways that innovation seems like it should be the practice instead of, you know, uh, something that we keep uh, trying to implement at different intervals, you know, whenever it feels safe. I don't think it feels safe anytime. I think it's just something we have to learn how to do. You mentioned being a content specialist. And I just wanted to make the connection that I think where this, this uh, breaking the mold behavior uh, comes into play is when you move from being a content specialist to being a people specialist. And, and mm. it sounds like places like ASU and um, outlier.org are focusing through surveys and maybe other mechanisms like the representation thing with outliers, they're focusing on the, the personal experience, right? And who, who they're teaching and not what they're teaching. Uh, and I think that that nets the greatest rewards, or it certainly seems to, you know, if, if we're thinking about ASU, I'm a big fan of them. Um, so let's move now into uh, some of our, you know, ending questions. Um, sure. what, what are you doing uh, or what do you want to share with our audience that you haven't talked about yet? Uh, I know that you just, you know, this, this book is coming out and I certainly encourage everyone to purchase it. It'll be in the show notes, I'm sure. Um, are you already working on the next thing or are you engaged in any other interesting projects? My colleague, uh, Pedro Ferreira and I are launching a new, um, uh, research center here called the initiative for teaching and education analytics. And it's based on the same idea you just talked about, um, personalization. Uh, so we, we both did a lot of research again in the entertainment industry. And what we discovered is that when you don't have any information about the customer, you make, you know, content that is generally applicable to everyone. Right. Um, that's all you can do. Right. Once, once entertainment companies started to get detailed personal information about the viewer, they were able to both say, I think I'm going to make you a customized interface that's going to show you exactly the stuff I think you're I think you're going to be interested in watching. Mm -hmm. And they were able to create stuff that just wouldn't have worked in a traditional broadcast channel, right? It not right. only not only changed how we present it to the audience, if you will, it changed what we could make. Um, I love that. What, it's like the Netflix queue where you pick your show and then underneath when you finish it, you might also like these other shows, right? Yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely brilliant um, that, you know, that they were able to make shows that just wouldn't have worked in the traditional broadcast channel. And they're able to delight you as an audience member because I know more about you. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's, what's the parallel? I think if we in higher education start to embrace some of these new channels, we're going to learn all sorts of wonderful things about our students. Mm -hmm. How, you know, what their background is, how they learn, do they learn, do, do they learn by example? Do they learn with theory? You know, all these, all these really cool things. I would love to see us harness that power mm -hmm. and say, how can I use the data to better deliver education to this individual student who is different than this other individual student? Right. Um, that's what that's what Pedro and I are excited about, you know, trying to explore. What what tell, data tell do we have? Tell us the name here? again. It's the, it's I, IT, I-T-E-A is the, is the title, the Initiative for Teaching and Education Analytics. Um, Excellent. We're doing, we're doing a project with, with Outlier, um, where we're trying to use their data to understand what characteristics of how the instruction is delivered mm -hmm. cause people to succeed in the course, right? Oh, it might I love that, that. It might be that my style of explaining something works for this segment of students your style of explaining something works for this other set of students let's use that to 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 get the you know the right style in front of the right student and you'll be able to do this for different institutions the the hope is if we can collect data about the customers mm -hmm. uh, about the, about the about the students excuse mm -hmm. me um 
that we could do that and you know we could have those algorithms work in any sort of of online class right and i like that you said customers first because truly remember we're talking to people who also believe that this is a business model um we know that students are students but look at what university of chicago did you know that worked in to their advantage right there are still going to be there will always be those institutions who see it only as a business model what i think your effort here and your institute is going to do is kind of pull back the curtain on the individual student and the person and maybe teach some of those old school folks a thing or two. So I, I applaud you for that. That's very exciting. Thanks. I, I hope so. Right. I mean, and we know this, you know, this, this is, this is Bloom's theory of mastery learning that mm -hmm. people, people learn better when you give them the time to learn topic A before you go on to topic right. B, we, we know that that works. Right. We've just never had the technology to make it work, right? right. You know, in, in a in a 30 person lecture hall, we've got to go on to the next, we've all got to go on to the next topic next week. Right. Even if student A is bored and student A, you know, student B is lost. Right. Wouldn't it be cool if I could let the you know, the student who's bored go forward and give the student who's lost a little bit more time to grasp this material. We've and that been differentiation, able to do that. yeah, that differentiation is something that public ed has been doing for years. But when we look at it from a technological perspective, we realize, I think, that if we're just willing to do the work yeah. to figure out what students need and really, really, truly and honestly, what is the best thing for them and not for us as teachers? and leaders and institutions, then we might really be onto something. I'll give you one, one last quote that I got from a, a colleague who gave me permission to use this without attribution. Um, but as I was talking about, you know, how can we use technology? Um, he said, a professor must have an incentive to adopt new technology. I'm a tenured old fart. I can simply wait out this shock until retirement. Innovation adoption will occur one funeral at a time, right? Oh he my! Was, he, was, <laughs> he was being snarky, right? <laughs> but there, but there's a grain of truth in that. That you know, if I'm just looking out for my own interest, I want to yeah. drag my feet as long as possible. I would love for I'd love for us as educators to get excited about. Let's do what's best for the student, even if my, even if it might not fit my private interests. That's a whole other episode, Michael. That quote <laughs> alone is a whole other episode. I'm going to need you to send that to me. That is fascinating and so true. And it, it cuts deep. And I think I encourage all leaders to, to rewind and listen to that quote again. I'm going to ask you our final question, which is, what do you think is the future of higher education? What I think, I, I hope the future of higher education is a much more inclusive um, much more flexible, much more personalized uh, way that we can let students um, gain access to the knowledge they need to make a difference in the world and then demonstrate that knowledge to people who are going to let them make a difference in the world. Today, Excellent. we've got, today we don't have that system. I would love for us to create a system um, that, that is much more inclusive, much more open to people who today we're excluding. Right. Well, I hope that we have more educators like you. It has really, truly oh. been a pleasure and an honor talking to you. Um, folks, you have just heard from Dr. Michael D. Smith from Carnegie Mellon University. I encourage you to get out and get his book, The Abundant University, Remaking Higher Education for a Digital World. It'll be out on September 19th. Um, and Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Um, to our audience out there, remember to tune in to like and share and leave reviews for the Ed Up Experience podcast. That's all we have for you today. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just Ed Up. Oh, uh, yeah. The Middle States Commission on Higher Education 2023 Annual Conference is in Philadelphia, December 4th through 6th. Setting the standard transformation through accreditation. Remember, only you can create transformation through networking, knowledge sharing, opportunity, leadership, service, learning, and accreditation. And you'll do all those things at the Middle States Commission on Higher Education Annual Conference this December 4th through 6th. Can't wait to be there. EdUp will be there. There's going to be over 1,300 attendees, presidents, provosts. The networking opportunities are off the chain. Register now at mshe.org.
Oh, yeah. Attention, higher ed marketing and enrollment management professionals. We are taking the EdUp Experience podcast to Insights EDU. Join us at Insights EDU on February 20th to 22nd, 2024 in Phoenix, Arizona. Gain insight into the latest higher education trends and cutting edge marketing strategies that'll take your institution's enrollment to a whole new level. This is your opportunity to connect with higher education leaders and marketing experts from across the country. Comprehensive presentations, engaging panel discussions, and more. Insights EDU will equip you to position your institution for growth. Register now at insightsedu.com and use the code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Can you afford to miss this conference? I don't think so.